How It All Began. Read by David Tennant. Right from the start, some of the older cavemen were completely against the idea. It's unnatural, they said. Anyway, where's it going to end? But the younger cavemen said, That's progress, Grandad. Pass us another log. The thing was called fire, and it was brought back to the cave by Og, the inventor, who said he found it eating a tree. You had to keep it in a little cage of stones, he said. It kept you warm, he said, which was the opposite of what you felt when the rain dripped into the cave at night. Hal, the chieftain, was a bit puzzled and worried by it. Are you sure nothing will go wrong this time? he asked. It was bad enough when I was hit by one of your throwing sticks. Spears, corrected Og. That was a design error, that was. This is foolproof. If you don't feed it with wood, it dies. Remarkable, said Hal. That night, the cavemen sat round the new fire and ate cold mammoth while giant creatures trundled and sneezed in the dark night outside. Og talked at length about the amazing possibilities of his invention. Hal just chewed his mammoth and watched the flames. The fire bit him. Ouch! You shouldn't touch it, said Og hurriedly. It's snappish. I'm going to bed, said Hal huffily, and shuffled off, sucking his finger. One of the women was appointed to look after the fire and keep it fed while the men were hunting. Soon it was part of the cave way of life. Then, one day... Og accidentally dropped a lump of wild pig into the fire and invented cookery. Cookery! Even Hal couldn't disagree with that. There were 27 ways of cooking mammoth to start with. There were dodo egg omelettes with snake sauce. There were great slabs of baked boar with honey gravy. And, of course, there were toadstool pies and deadly nightshade soup, which was unfortunate. You can't make an omelette without breaking eggs, said Og cheerfully. We all make mistakes. There was no stopping him after that. He drew with charcoal on the cave walls and invented art. He managed to tame a wolf puppy and invented dogs. But the trouble really started later. Og invented... Well, he happened to leave some grapes in a bowl of water, and when he remembered them, they had fermented. The wine tasted lovely. When everyone came home from hunting, they all tried it too. All except Hal. He was still down on the plains chasing a particularly fast giraffe. He stopped when he smelled smoke. It was coming from the cave. Hmm? He thought. The fire's broken loose. Hal dropped his giraffe and ran. All round the cave, the grass and trees were ablaze, and he grunted and swore as he crashed through the hot ash. Inside, the tribe were peacefully sleeping off the effects of Og's latest invention. Wake up! screamed Hal. You've let the fire escape! And it was growing fast. For miles around, great flames were crackling through the grass. Animals fled, birds flew, squawking out of the smoke. Half blinded by smoke, choking in the hot air, the tribe were led by Hal down to the river. They slopped down among the rushes and burst into tears. Hal was white with fury as he turned to the miserable Og. Right, he growled. That's it. I'm not standing for any more. I've had enough. Everything you do leads to trouble. I'm a patient ape man, but this time you've gone too far. Get out of the tribe. Og slunk away through the reeds without a backward glance. Is that wise? asked Ugg, one of the oldest ape men. He'll perish all by himself. Hal snorted. What chance has he left us, then? There'll be no game for miles around. The fire doesn't seem to have spread so far down river. Come on, if we don't move on, we'll starve. All the next day, they trudged through the mud. Here and there, the fire was still burning, and where there were no flames, there was just grey, hot ash. In the evening, it rained. The tribe slept fitfully in the branches of a charred tree, while growling saber-toothed tigers prowled beneath them. The rain continued all the next day. The tribe spent most of it huddled together in a little hollow in the rocks. After a while, someone said, 
The fire was warm. And someone else added, Cooked zebra was one of the best things that ever happened to me. As the sun sank into a mass of black clouds, even Ugg said wistfully, He wasn't a bad sort in his way. Hal shivered. He'd have probably set fire to the whole world if we'd let him, he muttered. A wolf howled in the distance. Another one answered. It was much nearer. Suddenly Hal saw the black shape padding around the edge of the hollow, and his hair stood on end. Women and children in the centre, he yelled, reaching for a stone. The wolves closed in. The ape-men hit them with sticks and threw stones, but the wolves were desperate with hunger because of the fire, and more of them seemed to be appearing. Then Og leapt into the hollow, holding a blazing branch in his hand. He hurled it at the wolves and started fiddling with an oddly shaped piece of wood. It was a bow. Arrows started raining down on the yelping pack. He didn't say anything. When the last of the wolves had fled, he simply beckoned the tribe to follow him, and led them to a small clearing where several zebras were roasting over a fire. Under some trees, he had built a strange sort of cave out of branches and bracken. It looked warm and inviting. Well, Hal couldn't refuse to let Og back into the tribe, not since most of the ape men were already tucking into slices of zebra. I followed you. I thought you might need me eventually, was all Og said. Soon, a little village had been built. Og discovered that seeds would grow and invented farming. He invented animal traps, which was a much better way of catching meat than hunting. Then he invented wings and unfortunately decided to try them out from the top of a cliff. But several up-and-coming young ape men had got the idea and they invented civilization. Eventually, the village grew. Some of the open plain was turned into fields. Pretty soon, the hunters like Hal were beginning to look a bit foolish. That's how it all began. Hal sat in front of his hut, looking thoughtful and feeling slightly uneasy. I wonder where it's all going to end. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the British Library. My name is John Fawcett. I am lucky enough to look after the events program here at the British Library. And I was delighted when the, uh, my colleagues in the exhibitions team said we were about to do an exhibition of fantasy fiction coming up this autumn, opening on the 27th of October. And there is no better place to start when you're talking about the masters of fantasy fiction than Terry Pratchett. So I got in touch with the estate and the publisher and they said, oh, We've got three Terry Pratchett books you might want to do events about this. Whole time. I thought, okay, let's go on, let's go on. So we're starting tonight. Obviously, you've just heard the uh, audio book, uh, the first story in the collection of Stroke of a Pen, written by somebody called David, read by somebody called David Tennant, um, <laughs> apparently. But there's an amazing cast of uh, readers on the audio book. But tonight, we'll also be looking into the stories themselves. Um, obviously, you, though, you've got a bookstall outside if you want to get one of these for the very first time today. Hello to everybody watching online, especially those in the libraries of uh, Rugby and Worcester as part of our Living Knowledge Network of libraries around the country. Um, those of you who want to buy a book and you're watching at home, you've got a little tab at the top of the screen which says books and you can pick one up there if you want to. So we have a brilliant event for you tonight. We've got the, the experts, uh, Pat and Jan Harkin, who discovered or rediscovered these amazing early stories by uh, Terry Pratchett and regional newspapers. We have uh, the uh, the um, reviewer, the uh, thriller uh, editor of The Observer, and a Pratchett fan, Alison Flood. We have the amazing John Culshaw, a Pratchett fan and longtime reader of his works, doing our readings and joining the conversation too. And uh, chairing tonight, we have the journalist, the book reviewer and editor, Katie Guest. So I think that's all from me. So please welcome to the stage our fantastic panel. Enjoy. <laughs> Hi, 
everybody. Happy Tuesday evening. I'm Katie Guest and I'm absolutely delighted to be here tonight to launch this beautiful book um, of collected short stories by Sir Terry Pratchett, who was not Sir Terry Pratchett when he wrote them. He was a mere young cub reporter writing on a local newspaper in Bristol, um, the Western Daily Press. And with me I have a panel of Experts, and by the way, I love the fact that a Pratchett expert is basically just a massive fan. Um, <laughs> we have the brilliant impressionist actor, comedian John Coleshaw, who is here tonight as himself, I think, mostly. Um, <laughs> Alison Flood, who's the culture and comment editor of The New Scientist, also writes about thrillers for The Observer, massive Pratchett fan. Um, and the real experts, Pat and Jan Harkin, who are... <laughs> incredibly impressive retired medical doctors also not just super fans but lord and lady of the uber fans um, <laughs> who um, well it might be better if you yourselves describe your relationship with Terry and what makes you such experts in his fiction how did you, how did you become how were you given these titles and these bumblebees Terry christened me lord of the uber fans in the frontispiece of uh, slip of a keyboard and it was a really cool title before the taxi company came along <laughs> <laughs> and so why did Terry pick me out of all the other fans I really don't know just we knew each other for years and years and years and years and got to got to be very friendly uh, I went to an awful lot of disc world events and spent a lot of time with Terry either Siri, obviously not in the bar drinking because that would just be you know <laughs> But, uh, but considering serious matters of literature and, uh, and good, such like. Good, good. Pleased to hear it. Um, I sort of got drawn into other aspects of Discworld fandom, uh, the conventions and whatnot. But uh, I sit here at the end of it all rather confused, to be frank, as to how I ended up <laughs> sat in our wonderful library. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, also, Pat uh, trained as a pathologist, and so uh, Terry would uh, occasionally ring us up at extraordinary times. We were, you know, in the car driving back from work or um, yeah, shopping, and uh, Pat's phone would go, and there would be uh, an interesting half uh, conversation going on. Um, yeah, I did mean to ask you, Pat, how much earwax does a person produce in a lifetime? A generous egg. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember the weight, but I've, I've, I've got a slide somewhat of that much lard on a spoon. <laughs> visual image. And that was one of the calls you had? Yeah, one, one Sunday morning, we were out buying a new microwave. Ours had died. <laughs> you know, currently mundane, 100%. Then the phone rings, and we're at 50-50. And I answered it, and the voice on the other end said, this stays between us, or there will be trouble. <laughs> Uh, Terry had a, well, we, I, I knew I would never talk about anything that he, he, he asked me if, if he wanted to kept in confidence. So why he chose that particular one to make it so clear, <laughs> I don't know. But he said, he, he said, how much earwax do you make in a lifetime? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I must have missed that lecture at medical school. <laughs> I'll see what I can do to find out. So I went back to the university and went to the medical library and got onto the computer and started searching for papers to do with earwax. <laughs> and some, I think there were Swedish ear surgeons in, in the mid-1970s that worked out a technique for doing it. Oh, crikey. <laughs> of measuring a day's production and then scaled that up over a lifetime. I love an author who does and, his research. I mean, to be honest, I could have got it wrong by a factor of 10 or 100 and probably nobody in the world <laughs> would ever know. But anyone wants who else to is check? going to have worked out that? <laughs> when in your lives did you each encounter his writing and what made you fall in love with it, John? Well, the first um, experience I had of, uh, of Terry's writing was uh, when I was voicing some of the characters in the Cosgrove Hall animations yeah. of the early 90s, which were just a, a delight. I was just starting out and to uh, have the challenge of voicing all of these characters um, was, was just dazzling. Um, you know, the theatre of the mind with which Terry writes is, is incredible. It's, it's really, really something. And you, you get very familiar. He's got his very own rhythm of writing and ideas. It's rather like um, a written version of a Buddy Rich drum routine. 
where it will start off in one way and then there'll be an observation across here and then there'll be another thought that uh, compounds on the top of that as well and just when you think the punchline of the conclusion of the piece is coming there will be another bit and it'll take it across <laughs> here and it'll end off in a much more delightful way than you ever thought uh, it's like a wonderful jazz paradiddle but in writing and it's Terry's alone it really is his unique style I love that description how about yeah. you Alison I think I was a sort of mid-teenager trawling the library for something new to, to read and I picked up Small Gods and I hadn't really been amused by fiction before and I suddenly discovered that I was <laughs> doing that thing that you're sort of snorting away to yourself and <laughs> what are you laughing at? So I loved Small Gods but then I got explored more and I think the one that I really fell in love was, with was We Free Men. Mm. Um, just I loved, I loved the story, I loved, yeah, so that was me. And you two? Well, we, we were introduced by one of your school friends, mm. by, um, by Graham. He lent us The Colour of Magic. Yeah, this, this is another part where the story makes no sense at all because I don't like fantasy writing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> now you tell us. Don't read it. Never liked it. Sci-fi, you know, laser blasters, OK, magic wands, meh. <laughs> <laughs> but... We went to visit a friend of mine. I went to school in London and then moved to Leeds when I graduated. But we went to visit a friend of mine and uh, we stayed for the weekend. And as we were packing the car to leave on Sunday, he suddenly said, oh, hang on, I've just finished this. You might like it. And he reached around and grabbed a book and handed it to me. And it was a paperback copy of The Colour of Magic. This was the first I'd seen of Terry's stuff. Yeah. And I read it and I quite liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I went round and found everything I could by Terry and it sort of just went rolling from there. Yeah. I mean, I was a sci-fi fan as well, and, um, but I, I really like the police procedural, mm. and so The Watch and the uh, oh. series are really my favourites, and also The Witches, because I think he writes women so well. Oh, yes. mm. Now, Terry was very clear about many things, um, and one of those things was that none of his unpublished writing was to be published after his death, to the point that in front of the national media, his computer hard drive was crushed by a steamroller. Not a haunted steamroller, although we might hear more about those later. Um, so tell us, these, publish, these stories were not unpublished. How did you come to find them, and how do we come to be reading them in this gorgeous collection now? Right, well, they, they were published, they mm. just weren't uh, recognised as being published. So uh, they're quite different from that end of the uh, um, semi, semi finished mm. novels. Um, so it really started at a, a conversation we had with Colin Smythe, um, Terry's um, agent and, and original publisher, um, who happened to say that he normally would like to go to the British National. Uh, newspaper uh, archives to check out every single thing that Terry ever wrote, both his journalistic and, and uh, stories, and uh, his website is a, is a great source of information for that. However, um, in about 2015, I think, it, it, the archive moved uh, up to Weatherby, um, a place called Boston Spa, just mm. outside Weatherby, and that's about 20 minutes drive from our house in Leeds. And so there was sort of vague suggestions that maybe whenever we could um, check things out. And indeed, before COVID, I think, uh, certainly just, just around that time, mm -hmm. um, we did have a few things that Colin wanted us to double check for him out of the journalism. And then um, we got a phone call, was it the end of January last year? Yes, it was. Yeah. Um, Colin rang us. He'd been contacted by a fan called uh, Chris Lawrence, who had, as a child, cut out of the paper all the parts of a sh serialised short story Terry had written. And even still had them, even had had them framed. And he'd, but he, he had, in the process of trimming them, lost all information as to which newspaper they came from. <laughs> <laughs> and when. <laughs> and so he'd, he'd gone to Colin's website. Uh, Colin's website is an amazing repository of... of Everything that we know about that Terry published is catalogued there. Uh, but there was no mention of, of this story, which is called The Quest for the Keys. So uh, Chris contacted Colin. Colin was interested, and Colin contacted us, asking if we would be interested in finding a previously unknown Pratchett story. And we thought it over for <laughs> a good 
five or four seconds <laughs> <laughs> before saying, yep. And uh, we set off. We got some, some dates from Colin as to, as to when it was likely to be. It was thought to be about 1972. That was well out, but <laughs> we had to start somewhere and we had a list of newspapers, so off we went to the library. Yes, I mean, there was a strategy to think about because um, you know, we, we had the dates when uh, Terry had started his journalism uh, in 1965 mm -hmm. and when he had sort of given up um, the day job for uh, full-time authorship and it was bracketed somewhere around there, maybe 1972 because we knew it was about 50 years ago um, and we knew the range of newspapers it might be. Um, so we then also knew from, uh, I, th I think Pat had some uh, experience doing a, a, a database trawl, that it's really important to just record everything, you know, s just go through things and be systematic about it, and then you don't need to repeat it if you, if you, um, you, know, if you miss a, a, a volume out. Uh, you need to be sure that you're recording all the stories and where the pages are, which journals, and so on. So we, we worked our way through from um, up to, we said, was it 1965 uh, to 84? We were going that way around. Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah, and oh yes. Yes, what did, what did you say this was, dear? Oh, that's Pat working for a change. <laughs> 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 he <is re> <laughs> yeah, he's retired. So yeah, yeah this, this, is, uh, this is actually the side room of the reading room at Boston Spa. Um, they, they quickly realised that when we, when we were there, we were working as a pair, um, and Pat's uh, laptop uh, is just in the background there. His, uh, his, and so we were recording things. I, my desk is just on the other side there. And between us, we, we would make occasional uh, sort of squeaks of enthusiasm when we found something. So to keep it quiet in the main reading room, <laughs> they put us in a side room. And, and <laughs> we, are, we are the bad boys of the British <laughs> <laughs> and there's a microfilm reader at the back there. Uh, and so you can see the newspapers were bound in these volumes, and we were, that's, that's the sort of workload we had. There's a bit on microfilm, wasn't there? Mm. Uh, those, each of those volumes will be from a single newspaper. If it's a daily newspaper, like I think the Western Daily Press was, was uh, a daily, it'll be, a be about a month's worth. If it's a, a weekly paper, it'll be about six months' worth. But they are physically the size of the original newspaper. They are the original newspapers. They're big and they're flat and they're heavy. <laughs> um, but we were going through them, working... Since it doesn't take two people to read a newspaper. Unless you're particularly creative, I suppose. <laughs> um, but th th we would work through two newspapers at once and then at the end of the afternoon bring together our work into a single spreadsheet. So we'd gone through uh, a particular day I'd got my stories, I'd entered them into the spreadsheet. Jan was dictating hers to me to enter into the spreadsheet. And she came to one as the Blackberry thing. That's right. And I entered it in the database. And she says, no, no, you've spelt it wrong. It's Blackberry, B-U-R-Y, not Blackberry, E-E-R-O-Y. And I thought, Blackberry. That rings a bell. The Johnny Maxwell stories are set in Blackberry. So I read further into the story, and it mentioned that... Uh, Blackberry was in Gritshire, which, again, I thought, I recognise that from the Terry stories. And indeed, it was true. And it seemed unlikely that these could just be coincidences. Not, not impossible. Blackberry, Blackberry, it's not that big a shift. Um, Gritshire, well, people might make that one up, but nonetheless, we weren't sure. So we contacted Colin. We sent him a couple of photographs of the Blackberry thing, and uh, we got a phone call back quite promptly. Yeah, it was a couple mm -hmm. of hours. It was really quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, saying, the style is undoubtedly Terry's. Uh, one thing that I know that you don't know is that Terry's maternal grandmother was called Cairns. Pratchett and Patrick, close enough to be interchangeable. Terry Pratchett, Terry Cairns, Patrick Cairns. And at that point, we knew we'd, we'd found something. I think at that point, we'd found three or four stories. Yes, yes, because we'd, we'd, we'd missed we three or four. Mm. You know, they were how the West was won. Oh, yeah, by Patrick Cairns. Not were, they, were the stories just kind of mixed in with the, with the news? Like, were there a lot of fiction bits in the papers? Uh, well, 
they were generally around the children's page. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the, there were some extra ones at Christmas. So uh, the thing that you see here is actually from 1970, and it's the Christmas Eve edition of the Western Daily Press. And you can see there's a story in the top right-hand corner, a partridge in a post box, which is by Patrick Cairns. But there's a suspicious little fellow there dressed as a wise man. Um, and he's going round Bristol looking for gold, frankincense, and myrrh for a feature. And that's Terry uh, from 1970. So on the same page, <coughs> he had a feature article under his byline of Terry Pratchett. And he had a story under his pseudonym of Patrick Cairns. <laughs> How did you feel when you read these stories and the pieces, the penny started to drop? <sighs> well, <laughs> well, at first we were a bit unsure because, of course, we needed confirmation. But, um, yeah, I mean, this page was just extraordinary. Uh, we, were so, we were so pleased to find that. <laughs> um, yeah. That's amazing. Every little extra bit we, we found was another... Another reason they put it in the side room, another squeal. <laughs> <laughs> These weren't even the first stories that you published, were they? Oh, no, no. 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 His, the, first, the first piece for which he was paid was a 19... He was 13 years old at the time, so that'll be 1961. Um, it's now been reprinted as the Hades business, a short story set in hell, applying modern business practices to it. <laughs> Um, but I think The Carpet People was published in 1965, so it's before these. And then I don't think there's another, for another, another book for a couple of years yet. So they're sort of very early at the beginning. He was a, practically a child writing these <laughs> and doing his uh, features. Uh, he started writing for the newspapers when he was 17. He left school without A-levels, but... Seems to have done all right. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and it, there are sort of seeds of, of greatness in there. I mean, there, there are great stories. They're great. But there, is, there are elements of them that are identifiably Pratchett. Which, which of those elements made you think, or made Colin think, hang on a minute, Patrick Kearns, mm -hmm. who is this? There's one of the one of the stories uh, was called Mr. Brown has a, Mr. B Mr. Brown's holiday accident. Oh yes. And there's a, a literature I don't know what we'd call it a, a, a mechanism he uses, which I don't want to identify because I think it's fun to find it, which matches something he used years later, seventeen years later in Mort, which is one of my favourite books uh, in the Discworld canon. Uh, that's the sort of the, the nearest, oh, I can match this to that. Because ultimately, I am not a literary analyst. Um, it's, it's, it's like art, you know. I don't know much about art, but I know what I like. I don't know what makes this funny, but it is. <laughs> and that's, that's, so that's the one that struck most to me, with Mr. Brown's Holiday Accent, which uh, I was quite pleased to have found the ending to. Yeah. But the general quality of his writing, I mean, um, right from the beginning, from the Books Free Press, when he was writing for the children's circle, we, we could spot when he started that, because it was actually anonymous. You could work out when, his writing, when he started writing that, because um, if you know the uh, film Morris and his educated rodents, mm. the rats carry round uh, a, a children's storybook, um, and it's, it's a pretty dire sort of storybook. It's, it's all about Flopsy the bunny and all that jazz. And you know, all Flopsy the bunny flibble flabble down to the river. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. that sort of stuff. Well, all the stuff before Terry was like that. Mm. And then suddenly there was Snibril and, and the, yeah. you know, the carpet mm. people. And, oh, hey, hang on, this guy can write. This is somebody different. Mm. The story you originally went looking for and didn't find until a long time afterwards was called The Quest for the Keys. I wonder if John would read us an extract from the Quest for the Keys and we can see if people can spot, see if you could have identified this was an early Pratchett masterpiece. Okay. <coughs> We're set on the lectern across here. There we are. <coughs> so, the Quest for the Keys. 
far away and long ago, when dragons still existed. Now, the only arcade game was ping pong in black and white. A wizard cautiously entered a smoky tavern in the evil, ancient, foggy city of Moorpork and sidled up to the bar. <laughs> Wizards aren't generally welcome in pubs. They tend to score 190 at darts. <laughs> I'm looking for a hired sword, this one said to the innkeeper. Ah, said the innkeeper. Someone who can brave unimaginable unimaginable terrors, fight nameless monsters, the usual stuff. The very same, said the wizard. A bloke in the corner might be your man. The wizard looked around. Sitting on a bench by the fire was a young man with the shoulders of an ox, an honest face, and the sort of impractical leather clothes that no true adventurer would be seen dead out of. <laughs> Reckon he's tough, then? Well, he's just eaten 15 bags of pork scratchings, <laughs> a bucket of cheese and smoky dragon-flavoured crisps, 10 pickled eggs, and an old individual meat pie I was using as a paperweight, <laughs> said the innkeeper. Good grief, said the wizard. And just give me a pint of inexpensive ale and a small lemonade with a cherry in it, please. <laughs> I, uh... I won't beat about the bush, he said, sitting down next to the big man. My name is Grubble the Utterly Untrustworthy. <laughs> and I'm looking for a hero. The man extended a hand like a bunch of bananas. That's me, he said. I'm called Kron. His mighty brows furrowed and his lips moved silently. Yeah. I'm sure that's right, <laughs> he said uncertainly. Yeah, Kron. <laughs> well, Kron, I just happen to have found out the whereabouts of the five keys of Zarg. What do you think of that, then? Kron's expression did not change. <laughs> I expect that's very nice for you. He said, no, 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 said Grubble sharply. You don't say that. You say, not the five keys of Zark, whose fabulous treasure has been seen by no man for a thousand years. Gosh, how marvellous. Let me help you in your quest. A wizard in exchange for no more than 20% of the treasure, less expenses. When do I start? <laughs> OK, <laughs> said Cron. I wasn't doing much today anyway. <laughs> we'll have to hurry, said Grubble. The first one shouldn't be too tricky. It's kept by an old witch who could only do food spells. Should be uh, a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> Seems fair enough, said Cron. When do I start? Gondro Pistro, shouted the wizard. Cron vanished so suddenly that there was a small thunderclap. Can't let him ask too many questions, said Grubble to himself as he hurried from the inn. He'll just have to do what he's best at, and I'll have to do what I'm best at, which will probably involve swindling him out of his share of the treasure if he ever finds it. Shouldn't be too difficult. He seems a bit lightweight in the head department. Hang on, said Cron. There's one or two questions I'd like to... And thank you, that was made for you. And do you know what? One of the things I love about these stories is they read as if this is a writer having so much fun. Oh, yes. There's, there's one of them in which the names are things like Councillor E.I. Adio, and there's, a, there's a, an alderman, Maurice Oxford, who is the chairman of the Blackberry Borough Finance General Purposes and Miscellaneous Things Committee. <laughs> He's just sitting there thinking, I can't believe I'm getting paid for this. <laughs> and that's so much fun to read because it's of it. probably based on someone that Terry had met, and he'll find an amusing way to turn it into Quite a beautiful likely. character. <laughs> Are they just as much fun to read out loud. As, a, as an editor, I often say to first-time writers, when you're writing dialogue, try reading it out loud and see if it sounds okay. Yeah. 
obviously he's he's a pro he's done that Had, what are the voices like what's the dialogue like what's what's it like to read them you you see the pictures in your mind instantly uh when i was narrating the uh, city watch series uh, neil gardner the engineers here uh, we were at Lab Recordio for many days, many weeks, uh, just going through the volumes. And you, you're sat in a, a little grey recording box. But my goodness, the, the theatre of the mind just takes you to the, you know, the, the, the wonderful, you know, the, the disc world, this wonderful fantasy universe. And within it, the characters who are so salt of the earth, so identifiable. And that gorgeous way that it's not the characters who you expect will become the heroes, but they do. Such as Sam Vimes, he starts off as a, as a drunk and as a, you know, you never expect him to be the character. You think maybe Carrot is being set up for that. But, you know, soon we did, um, we did him as Sean Bean, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with a little ciggy in his mouth, there like that, and, you know, grit, granite, nouse, and knows how to um, exploit a situation when it comes, experience. See, you've just got this fizzing in your mind. And, and Terry's beautiful wit that you really get in. By the time we got up to volume five, Jingo, you know, very familiar with the characters then. And um, Sergeant Cole on, I based uh, his voice on uh, Michael Backhouse, um, uh, uh, an English literature teacher that I'd had. <laughs> you know, got a, a certain sense of experience, but, you know, can be flustered when things don't go quite... <laughs> Nobby knobs, I could see someone just scrambled up like that, sort of based him on Ken Campbell, that kind of thing. <laughs> and Vetinari is uh, a slightly more sinister Christopher Lee. <laughs> <laughs> but Sam Vimes isn't scared of him. Yeah, all right, OK, you know, whatever, keep your Inverness cape on or whatever. <laughs> It's, it's, it's the gorgeous characters. Your imagination just goes off, as it has done now. Sorry for that. <laughs> John, did you ever meet him? I did. I did. And it was, um, it was an amazing um, a couple of occasions. It was at Patrick Moore's house, uh, Farthings, in, in uh, Selsey, uh, at some recordings of The Sky at Night. Whenever there was an event, a, a star-watching party, Many times Terry would go along with his great interest in astronomy. And there was one time when he and Patrick Moore were having a conversation and they were rocking back with laughter uh, when Patrick Moore was recounting a story about how he telephoned um, the council of, um, of Cornwall to say, yeah, I'm so sorry, the solar eclipse has been postponed. <laughs> <laughs> Terry was really enjoying this story of you know, Patrick Moore's mischief. He related to that. But I, I can remember what one gathering at Patrick Moore's house. It was for um, a, a lunar eclipse. And uh, the, the moon was turning gradually brick red. And uh, Dr. Brian May was there. And um, Patrick Moore was there holding court, looking up next to one of his, uh, his brass telescopes. And at the side of him, there was a silhouette of the hat looking skyward, <laughs> the beard, the long coat, looking at the moon turning gradually brick red. And I thought, good grief. Terry himself could have written this very scene <laughs> in which there he is at the centre. And it was ma I think he just radiated magic wherever he went. There was yeah. something so wizard-like. And, you know, at the high council of, of writers, you know, Tolkien, Douglas Adams, Terry's absolutely there. Mm. And he just brings a magic and a mystique. He was magic, but he was also described as a as a very blue collar writer. He was industrial at it. He, you know, he didn't fart about producing literature. He mm -hmm. quit his day job to write as a day job, and he really worked hard at it. Um, and I think there are elements in in these stories of his work as a journalist. How do you think, Alison, his his journalism comes through in the way that he writes, or what he he writes? Oh, interesting question. I guess I don't, I'm thinking of a story. That he, there's one of the stories, one of the Santa stories. Um, there's a few Christmassy stories mm. in here. And it, which one is it? Um, it opens up and the, the elves have unionised. <laughs> 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 and not only does that remind me of, of Discworld and, and Snuff and, and, and other stories in which Terry kind of takes these magical creatures and makes them very much part of the real mm. world, but I guess it's, it must have been stuff that he saw as a journalist too that he would have reported on. 
I, I guess. There's a, there's a line, there's a story called The Haunted Steamroller, of course. Um, <laughs> and there's a brilliant line in it that really stuck with me, um, in which the narrator says, now remember, this is Gritcher. If it was anywhere else, people would start making all kinds of odd explanations, but in Gritcher, and particularly around Blackberry, strange things happen every day and people are more sensible. Magic, said the mayor. Oh dear. And it just reminded me so much of how magic just runs through everything in practice worlds as if it's just part of the natural order of things. It reminded me a little of a, of a line in Weird Sisters which goes, magic glues the disc world together, music generated by the turning of the world itself, magic wound like silk out of the underlying structure of existence. And in those worlds, magic, at least witch's magic, is, is, is natural, it's, it's the way things are. What appeals to you about the way that magic is the engine of, of um, Terry Pratchett's stories and, and the way it runs through all of his fiction? I think it, it, it does run through it all, but it's also prosaic, isn't it? It's like just part, it's part of everyday life for these people. I've just been rereading um, Equal Rights, <coughs> which is one, another of, of my favourites, and I love the way that Esk in that slowly discovers her magic, but she doesn't discover it by becoming a wizard. At first she learns from Granny Weatherwax what, what it is to, to learn about the real world before, and she has to go through so many steps of sort of learning about herbs and going out for long walks and everything before she's allowed to do anything at all that's, that's real magic. So it's like the magic of the everyday is really important so much, as much as the, the wizardly magic that mm. she goes on to learn later. What about you guys? What's your impression of the magic in the worlds of Pratchett? It, it's everywhere and nowhere. The, the, the wizard's view of magic is that it's something that you don't use. Mm. Uh, the witches have headology and sort of pretend that there's no magic, but they, they really do have it. Um, it it's, it's too easy, says the man who's never written a book in his life. <laughs> <laughs> it's too easy in writing a fantasy story to say... And then he did that with his magic wand, and it was all better. Mm. Magic, is, is, magic is, is too powerful for a beginning writer. Mm. It's, but it's something that Terry could control, he could master it. He knew just how much magic he could get in to get away with things where he needed to be able to do something magical. Mm. And how he could, he could step away from it and say, no, we, we, we don't need that. Mm. Yeah. And, and somehow that makes it more satisfying to me. And there's a dark side too, like in mm. Lords and Ladies, where um, there's a real menace with magic. Mm. So, uh, yeah, he, he plays with the, the light and the dark side. Do you think he had to learn his magic the same way Esk does, for instance? He had to be careful with it? I don't know. He had, he had friends in the folklore uh, community who I think he, again, mm. used as, as sources. So um, learning about... Um, that, that deep magical folklore mm. uh, is really important in the background for his mm. books, I'm sure. And the, the process S goes through in becoming aware of magic is, is very much the, the early Tiffany Aiken mm. process, where, again, she must learn what magic is before she can even think about relying on it. Mm. Mm. We all love a story of someone discovering their, their secret magical powers that actually they're the one. <laughs> Terry does it very well. Yeah. Especially when it's a girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that the, as, a, as, a, as I say, he was a very young journalist and he was writing hyper-local stories, we would call them now, about steam fairs and council meetings and planning disputes and you know, golden anniversary couples who were telling him all sorts of things about married life that he didn't really want to know aged 17. <laughs> <laughs> and he also revealed at some point that Nanny Og was based on a real person he knew in his childhood. He was a family friend. And he did write about the ordinary people, didn't he? He wrote about the overlooked, but he didn't overlook them. As you say, the people you didn't expect to be the hero were the hero. He wrote about grannies and nanas and little girls and, and observed them as they had been unobserved. Um, what, what other sorts of themes of his, of his writing do you see in these stories? Because I see, you know, steamrollers and steam fairs and, 
and country fates and planning meetings and councils who are concerned about how to control the exploding pie. <laughs> Footnotes. <laughs> and footnotes. I was very happy to see some Terry footnotes popping out there. And I do, I do feel like you just see the, the writer that he was going to become when, when you're reading them. For example, there's a lovely bit in one of the stories, which do, it's just at the beginning, so it won't give anything away for anybody who wants to read it. So this is a story called The Blackberry Jungle. It happened, like most things in Blackberry happen, at 10 past three in the afternoon. <laughs> Asterisk. <laughs> <laughs> Everything in Blackberry happens at that time because the town hall clock stopped at ten past three one day. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's exactly what you were saying before, that he gives you a sentence and then he builds on it a bit and then he builds on it again and he's like, oh, this is so pleasurable. Well, and those are the moments where you'll think, no, I'll make them wait for a bit for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, just, I just love it, but... Um, Reading um, Equal Rights, is, I mean, it's, it's doing that all of the time, so I'll just read you this tiny bit from near the beginning where he does exactly that. He sets you up with something, and then you're like, oh, <laughs> didn't expect that. So he says here, mist curled between the houses as the wizard crossed a narrow bridge over the swollen stream and made his way to the village smithy, although the two facts had nothing to do with one another. The mist would have curled anyway. It was experienced mist, and it got curling down to a fine art. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's so beautifully done. It's so subtle. It's like he, he's worked on that and made it perfect as a perfect little paragraph there. And you can see that in here often, not always, not as much as something, something like this, where it's just threaded through with silver all the way. But there's lots of bits where you're just like, oh, as, as in the, the bit that you, that you read to us. Just so many moments of like, oh, you've got me again. <laughs> <laughs> It's like you're waiting for the punchline and you think you can see the punchline coming. Yeah. And then the punchline comes from behind you. <laughs> it's not what you expected at all. Yeah. Did you two see in those, when you first discovered them themes that you thought, you know, this is, this is something I recognise, whether it was the characters or the settings or the... Well, as Pat said, it was, you know, the, the Gritshire and the um, Blackbury uh, were very much... And then when, when you actually read them through, then it was clear that... You know, there was an awful lot of, um, well, like, well, like the quest for the keys um, is, is really like an early disc world. It, it does feel like it could be on disc world in a way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he was, he was a reporter with a, with a space to fill. So mm. also they're varying in size. And I'm sure that's because <coughs> he's told, you know, you've got so many hundred words this week and so many hundred words next week. And, you know, yeah. he had to make them fit. Um, there was no such thing as writer's block. You had to get on with it and, uh, and write surprise. stories. Yeah. I bet he was also told, man, it's Christmas in two days. <laughs> Nobody expected this. What can we <laughs> use to fill the paper? Terry, yeah. <laughs> over here, get your pen out. But it was great to actually go through the newspapers because, of course, they were the internet. You didn't mm. have the internet. So every little bit of local life was there. As you say, all the small ads, all the small clubs and, and societies had their reports. And every bit of activity had to be reported by usually the juniors mm. who had to go out and, and, and sit through that dramatic society's Aya Lancy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we learned that the 70s were really dull. <laughs> <laughs> With an occasional little Pratchett story hidden in, <laughs> or some interesting piece of news. But yeah, you know, the, the, the badminton club final <laughs> took place this weekend. Oh, great. <laughs> but, I mean, you must remember that we found all the Patrick Cairns stuff fairly early on. But we couldn't stop because we were actually asked mm. to find the quest for the keys. <laughs> and we hadn't done that at that point. Um, so we then had to press on through. Uh, to 1984 to, to find the, uh, the story. So 12 years' worth of, of local paper. Well, we, we started in 65. OK. But we, the, the, there, are, there is more than one newspaper involved because Terry moved jobs. So we didn't read every issue of all the papers for all the however many years it was. We, we concentrated, at least at first, on when Terry was known to be working for them and hence a more likely uh, source of, of, of material. And which of you eventually came across the quest for the keys and what was your, what was your reaction? It, I think it was me. Isn't that awful? I can't actually remember. <laughs> it was you. Yeah. Yeah, because we'd... Yeah, we'd it we, was. We were going to give up at the end of 1983 because we thought, well, I, there was... Uh, more pork was mentioned mm. in the story and we thought, well, he'd already published, so he couldn't use more pork again. But we'd still not found anything, and we knew he'd given up 
um, the day jobs in 87. So we thought, well, maybe just, just go through 84 again and check. And it was sort of middle of July, no, end of July uh, 1984 that the first one turned up. Yeah, I think it was you. Um, yes, yeah. yes, I, yeah. Yeah. it was. Um, Did they have to close the door on you guys? Again? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we'd still be bricked up in there if, 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 we'd, if we'd behave the way we wanted to behave. Uh, yeah, and then yeah we but we, we, we found it. There it was. And as you say, we'd got there by starting in 1965. That was, what, 20, 29 years of newspapers? No, 19 years of newspapers. A lot of newspapers. <laughs> um, right back at the beginning, we'd had to decide whether to start in 1965 and work forwards or start in 1984 and work backwards or start in the middle, but mm. we, we decided that way madness lay. <laughs> so we decided we would start at the beginning and move forwards. And although it meant we spent months reading thousands and thousands of pages of newspaper, it was a very fortunate mistake. If we had chosen to start in 1984 and work backwards, we would have found the quest for the keys in the first week, maybe on the very first day. And having done that, we would have gone, we found a practice story and gone home. <laughs> Job done. And we would never have come back through. We would never have found Patrick Cairns. Um, and the book would be a lot thinner. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to seem rude, but unlikely heroes, worst wizards at the university, come on, starting at the wrong end and ending up being the hero of the story. <laughs> Somebody could have written this. <laughs> Where are you, precious? I'm still, <laughs> still running my life. <laughs> you do get a lovely sense, don't you, of the, of the inspiration perhaps Terry took from that time of writing with the papers. You know, the salt of the earth characters, you, know, you, you get all the warmth and lovability from them. And to rebel, perhaps, against, you know, the council meeting end of things, <laughs> changes to commercial property legislation, whatever. <laughs> rebel against that by creating a fantasy world. Mm. So you have the best of each brought together. And you, you can just sense that cauldron starting to, yeah. starting to effervesce at that time. You, you? you mentioned before the story Mr Brown's holiday mm. accident, and I think you could maybe particularly see that in, in, in that story, someone <laughs> setting off on their holiday and then discovering the whole world is kind of just scenery, <laughs> which you do discover very early in the story, so I'm not, I'm not spoiling anything for you there. <laughs> but you can imagine the count, the, so someone who's sort of weighed down by local councils and everything yeah, like that, thinking... What's course, really behind it all? Yeah, there's a bureaucrat in an office mm. Mm. who's, who's good-humouredly mocked. Yeah. Speaking of the little people who become the heroes of the story, there's one story called A Partridge in a Postbox in which the hero of the story is not the lady who has delivered the 12 days of Christmas or the, the man, we assume, not necessarily, we're modern people, uh, who, who sends the gifts but the postman who delivers them. Would you, would you read us that story, John? And, and so we can yes. find out about this. this I love that Terry gave hero. him this consideration. What about this fellow who has to actually yeah. deliver all of this? <laughs> <coughs> Let's have a look at this one. Okay. A partridge in a postbox, yes. On Christmas Day, a large and oddly shaped parcel arrived in the tiny post office of Collip St Pancras. Albert Button, the postman, took one look at it and said, I can't deliver that. It's much too big. Anyway, what is it? You're not going to believe this, <laughs> said the postmaster. But it's a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> And sure enough, from inside the brown paper and sticky tape came a rustling and grumbling noise, such as a small angry bird might make after spending all night in a parcel. <laughs> so Albert Button put it on the front of his bike and pedalled all the way up to a big house on a hill. And the door was opened by an extremely beautiful young lady who gave him a tip. On Boxing Day, there was a crate full of cooing noises. Express delivery, said the postmaster. I understand. It's two turtle doves. The next day he peered through the basket work and saw three little fat bear birds wearing berets and drinking red wine. <laughs> One of them was playing an accordion. <laughs> oh, 
I suppose these are the three French hens, <laughs> said Albert, heaving them onto his bike. On the fourth day of Christmas, her true love never thought about the poor old postman, <laughs> panted Albert, wheezing away up the hill with a parcel containing four very heavy calling birds. <laughs> Next day, of course, there were only five golden rings, which the young lady was very pleased with. She smiled at Albert and he whistled all the way home. He didn't even mind about delivering the six geese on which the following morning were her laying all over his mailbag. <laughs> he was more concerned with the seven swans a swimming. <laughs> they can break a man's arm with a blow of their nose, he said. <laughs> On the eighth day of Christmas, he said to the eight maids of milking, now, now look, ladies, there isn't no room at all for you, for, for all of you on my bike. I'll just have to carry you one at a time, like on the crossbar. <laughs> and he blushed. By the ninth day, Albert had got into the swing of things. Right then, lads, he said to the drummers, who were standing around rather aimlessly with penny stamps stuck all over them. <laughs> <laughs> all together now, a one, a two, a one, two, three, four. On the tenth day, he rode ahead proudly on his bike, while behind him, the ten pipers played, Will ye no come back again? <laughs> on the eleventh day, he waltzed, fox-trotted and tangoed up the hill with eleven ladies dancing, in particular a rather fetching lady with black hair who gave him a kiss. <laughs> but on the twelfth day of Christmas, the postmaster said, That's right, I've got lost. Lost, said Albert. Lost? How can you lose 12 lords a-leaping? <laughs> They're probably a-leaping in a good siding at Crewe, <laughs> said the postmaster. British Rail has spent all morning looking. They found all kinds of things, but no lords. They did find a small baron in a letterbox near Bath. <laughs> <laughs> but I told him it wasn't one of ours, and they put him back. That's terrible, said Albert. She'll be so disappointed. Perhaps you'll think her true love forgot to send them. He leapt on his regulation bicycle and pedalled madly off towards the head post office in Blackbury, where he and all the other postmen, who had heard about the strange presence, sifted quickly through the parcels. There was not even one night, and not so much the smell of an earl. Albert Button sat down on a pile of letters with his head in his hands. He looked blearily at the other postman. There were six. And the telephone manager and his engineers, that's nine, he thought. <laughs> and the head postmaster and his deputy, and me, and X-12. Gentlemen, he said, standing up, this is a drastic situation. There is a place round here. Is there a place round here where we can hire some silk knee breeches and a dozen coronets? <laughs> On the twelfth day of Christmas, the young lady in the house on the hill looked out of her window to see a large trampoline being hauled into position <laughs> on the front lawn. Right, let's, hissed Albert, leap for your lives. <laughs> Up and down they went, spinning in cartwheels and somersaults and figures of eight, boing, spring, bounce. Where up? We're lords. <laughs> said Albert pointedly as he sailed past the window upside down. <laughs> Make no mistake about it. <laughs> Ain't we, lads? <laughs> she smiled and waved to them. On the 13th day of Christmas, she got married to her true love and the best man who stood there in his best uniforms, his buttons all polished and the five gold rings in his hand was Albert Button. There was a lord's coronet wedged tightly onto his head. <laughs> he had to put his cap on over the top of it, but he was smiling. That's brilliant, John, thank you. Again, what I love is, yes, he was writing about wizards and dragons and magic and castles, 
But this is such a cliche. He was writing about human nature. He was writing about people and the way they get on with each other. <coughs> Who is each of your favourite characters in his entire fictional output and why? You can choose more than one. I think I can answer quite easily because of when I read it, but I think it is Tiffany and it's because I wanted to be her. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, well, Granny Weatherwax, oh, yeah. just for the headology. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe wanted to be her a little bit as well. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have to go for death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, <Righty. coughs> He's in more books than anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> he must be the best. Hang on, what was your job? Oh, before I retired. <laughs> yes, yes, I was a pathologist. <laughs> <laughs> But that's just a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> and how about you, John? I think I've got to go for Sam Vimes. Yeah. I think I've got to go for Sam. Um, I, I can just see him, even when there's no dialogue, even when he's not speaking, I can just see him. There's a certain look in his eyes. <laughs> there's a certain way he holds a cigarette, you know, a certain <laughs> little thing like that. And he's just weighing things up and his experience is there. Experience that he's just built up by accident over many years. Um, but he, he's a true down-to-earth soul with real nous and grit. Uh, somewhere between, as I say, uh, Sean Bean and DCI Gene Hunt from Life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when he gets the opportunities, when he gets the chances for great glory, and he handles it really very smartly and, and with gumption. Gumption, oh, that's yeah. what he's got. Oh. I love him for his gumption and he gets the big jobs and he handles them very well with, with truth. And it's, it's wonderful to see someone like him in places like that. And I wish this world reflected it a bit more. I was going to ask you all what you think the fans' response will be to reading these new old stories. <laughs> new, to, new to us, old to Pratchett. But why don't we ask some of them? Um, we have some time for questions. You can address questions to any member of this panel. I think it'd be fun if each questioner said what your own favourite character is and why, and then ask any question you like. Do we have a... We don't have a mic, so you're going to have to speak clearly. We do have a mic. Yay! So please wait for the mic to come to you, and then everybody in the audience can hear your question. Who's going to be first? And I can see two hands have gone up. So there's one down here in the third row, in the, handily in the aisle for the mics. Veterinary, because... Despite all of it, he didn't do it for personal gain, really, which I find fascinating. I, I have a really banal question. Th these stories were uh, serialised, and Quest for the Keys is quite a long story. How many episodes was it in the paper? 36? Oh, yeah. goodness. 36. I mean, ty typically, they were two, three, four, maybe five. But the Quest for the Keys was written after a seven-year gap. Mm started during the summer holidays and was appearing in the paper every day. And then when school started, it dropped to being once a week. But it was, I think, 36 pieces in total. Yeah. It had a quiz as well. Um, <laughs> and, and you could win a tent. If you, uh... <laughs> and, and we're in with the chance because Chris Lawrence hadn't kept that bit of the paper. <laughs> so only we have seen the map. <laughs> Yeah, there were four winners named, so, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. They each won a tent. <laughs> Just said, we hope you enjoy your tent. I don't know whether it was, you know. <laughs> Quite an ironic thing to win, isn't it? <laughs> 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 uh, who was next? You were next, right there. Hello. Uh, Rincewind, uh, because I started with Colour of Magic and the point-and-click Discord adventures, and he was great in both of them, and the only person I've cosplayed as. Um, I think I read in one of the early introductions, he said that he started off by writing uh, Choose Your Own Adventure, like text games, and some of the characters were sort of based on that. I wondered if you're sort of going into old history, whether any of those still survive. Apparently he said the luggage was based on, he wrote this thing that you could tell the luggage to go somewhere, and if you forgot about it, it would just walk off the edge of a cliff. <laughs> um, I don't know if any of that survives anywhere. <coughs> I think it's the, there, was the, there were the point-and-click adventures, but before that, there was a text-driven adventure 
for the ZX Spectrum and Commodore 64 and, uh, and similar things. Um, but I don't know enough to tell you details about the luggage wandering off. Terry was very much into a, oh, um, a, a game called... Oh, somebody, somebody rescue me here. Um, he, he wrote an add-on. It's a game you, you could play in a sandbox mode and write add-ons for... Oblivion? I didn't hear Oblivion? that. Oblivion, yes. Yeah. Uh, and Terry was very much into that and would write add-ons or, or pay for other people to write add-ons for him. Uh, it's, a, it's probably an eventually a, a eternally expandable game. You could just write new bits in. Um, for example, some team of professional meteorologists decided that the lightning and thunder in this game wasn't realistic enough. <laughs> so they wrote better thunder. <laughs> <laughs> and Terry came up with the idea of a companion who would sort of keep an eye on you, because it was very easy to go away and do things and forget about eating and drinking and little things like that. And then all of a sudden you die. <laughs> So he, he created a companion who follows you around and goes, have you thought about getting something to drink? <laughs> <laughs> it's a while since you've ate, dear. <laughs> uh, and uh, he, 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 he paid for the programmers. I think he, he started off doing it himself, but he eventually paid for the programmers to do it and brought the lady whose idea had originally been over from somewhere in Scandinavia for a book launch. Does Colin remember? Never met her. No, I never met her either. Uh, that was on the, on the launch for uh, Raising Steam. Okay. On the steamboat, the wonderful Fanny. <laughs> <laughs> or it would have been, that was the plan, was that the, the boat in which the launch event was held was going to be renamed the wonderful Fanny for the night. <laughs> but then they discovered that you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably to stop people committing international piracy and then <laughs> becoming somebody else to get away with it. I, you probably all know this, but his daughter, Rihanna, is a computer game writer. She writes, she's brought in to write the stories and the character. And I interviewed her once for a, a magazine for women who write, and she was telling me about when she was brought in to write Lara Croft's story, her character, and to fill in the, the real human emotional content. And she wrote this elaborate scene just before Lara Croft shoots someone for the first time. And she wrote about her feelings about it and how conflicted she was and how she was thinking about her childhood and, and her parents and how difficult it was to pull the trigger. And eventually the games people just came in and said, and then she shot him. I <laughs> pulled <laughs> <laughs> that out. But she, you know, she at least tried. Um, we have a, a lady in a spotty shirt here. And, and then next, oh, sorry, the man has the, with the check shirt has the microphone next and then the lady in two rows in front. Uh, so Gaspo, the wonder dog, uh, because why not? Um, so I had the joy for the last two years directing all 41 audio books and I spent 32 days with the wonderful John Coleshaw <laughs> so cool. buying each other far too many lunches. Um, I'm not sure if this one's actually on. Um, John, we hear the voice and I'd be interested to know if those who have listened to all the audiobooks noticed. How did you feel about doing Terry? And did anyone spot him in the books yet? Yes, in one of the final, in the final volume, there was um, an extract from, it, it, it was an account of a, of, of a show or something like that. And the end of Snuff. The end of Snuff, that's right. And we thought, is, is this a point, just, just at the end here, to just try and adopt that tone of Terry and just, just have it be there as a little final, those who spot it, you know, just a little gentle raise of the hat like that. So, yes, I, do, I remember doing that. It, um, it had a real certain atmosphere doing it, didn't it? The, that grey recording room in Croydon lit up. <laughs> Stop dissing my studio. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> you know. Oh, 
gosh, now I have to decide. Um, <laughs> either Vimes or Granny Weatherwax, purely because I think it would be great if they existed and the world would be a nicer place <laughs> should they exist. Um, so my question is, uh, I can't remember who said it, but Terry either called himself or it might have been Neil Gaiman, where he said he was writing out of anger and he was writing about what he wanted to fix and it was very much like coming from a point of sort of aggression and wanting to change things. Do you see that in these stories or is that something that comes much later on? I think that's a really great question. <laughs> I, uh, when I read them, I, I had, I, I didn't. I th feel like they're, 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 they're warm and, and funny and it's sort of like go back it, going to a very happy place when, when, when you're reading them. I didn't really feel an anger coming through them, but I'd be interested to hear what, what others thought. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think, I think the yeah, there are some angry undercurrents in in the books, but I think that's sort of later on, um, perhaps after the light, fantastic onwards. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I think Neil is is right, and he says that Terry channeled his anger usefully to to drive his writing. He, he don't know quite how to phrase this. He didn't let it affect him. He controlled it. Like you read of witches and wizards channeling magic, fumbling it. It's horrible, dangerous stuff, but they can keep it under control and do useful things with it. And Terry did the same with his, with his anger about you know, injustice in any of its forms, uh, up to the, the, the personal injustice of, of his PCA, his Alzheimer's uh, variant at the end. There are certainly stories here in which bureaucracy or meddling or a certain sort of... Um, petty use of power is mocked, but it's it feels like it's mocked, doesn't it, rather mm. than being railed against. Mm. And and perhaps that's the best way of railing is is mocking power. It's a quite a gentle mocking, I think, compared yeah. to the maybe how we see it in later later books. But it's quite a gentle abuse of petty abuse yeah. of power too. <laughs> Yes, I think you take those characters and just position them in such a way so that their absurdity was plainly visible. Mm. Mm. And it was Terry's way of going, there you are, yeah. there it is for you. That's, yeah. that's why, that's what it is. Yeah. So you would do that. There's a guy in Blackberry Weather who I'm thinking of. I won't give you any spoilers, but uh, look out for Blackberry Weather. <laughs> a bit of that. Um, who's got the microphone next? Um, r why not go right next to you and then after that, this lady at the very front. Uh, hi, I think my favourite character is E.J. Pessimal, <laughs> the accountant who <laughs> works for the city watch and he ends up savagely attacking, attacking a troll um, because I'm an accountant, so... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we've all been there. <laughs> My question is, obviously these stories uh, were written over a long, quite a period of time. Did you notice any sort of development in the writing or change in characterisation over that period from the earliest to the latest stories? The stories that we found, le leaving aside the quest for the keys, which is the story of the, the elephant in the room. What's the opposite of <laughs> the elephant in the room? Anyway, the thing that we have to put on one side and not talk about because it's completely different. <laughs> uh, but the, the stories we found are published only over about a two-year period. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I wasn't specifically looking for a change in style. Uh, and as I've said before, I am not a literary analyst. <laughs> uh, I probably they wouldn't stop it any spot it anyway. Do they appear in chronological order in this book, in the order in which they were written? Do you know? I don't know. I don't think they can, because there's a lot of Christmas ones in a row. That's true. Yeah. 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 Hmm. If there are only That's the magic of Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, it does list in the back the order that they were originally published, uh, but I, have, oh, yes. I didn't actually think to see if it was oh, yes. in chronological order. Katie, you asked at the beginning about um, could you spot kind of the journalist, journalist in him, and I thought that the, the story that you read, The Partridge in the post office really showed that, that it was that feeling like we need to have a story about Christmas in here. <laughs> Terry plucks this... Mm. 
this song out of the air and turns it into something that is is mm. funny and, and moving and, and all squashed into however many words he was, <laughs> he was allowed to have for it. And the Scrooge story, I mean, mm. how many times has the Scrooge story been retold over the years? And who does it take to find a completely new and original and surprising version? And hilarious. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. And Terry always made great use of things which on television would cost an utter fortune <laughs> to actually realise. But with imagination, you can do it. Mm. You know, the Lords are leaping on a hired-in trampoline, <laughs> for example. <laughs> His imagination is, just delivers it. It's the trampoline that makes that scene. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and sail past the window upside oh, yeah. down. Just a little throwaway <laughs> upside down. Yeah. On, on the swans. A swan, a swan can break your arm with a blow of its nose. <laughs> You know, it takes, it takes the old phrase we all know breaks the, with a uh, blow of, of its uh, wing. And it comes a blow of its nose, blow no... Oh, no. Yeah. There's something wonderful, Tony, Tony Hancock, about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Elements of that, though. And it's the matching of the prosaic with the ridiculous as well, mm. the looking mm. for the Lord in the heavy goods... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Next question. Hi. Um, obviously, we're very glad that you did all that research. But I do have to ask, would you do it again? <laughs> <laughs> Knowing how long it took you. I think we can say yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'd yeah. go and do it again right now if somebody said, we heard a rumour that the uh, <laughs> Cornish Gazette had a story about wizards in 1972. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the reading room at Boston Spa doesn't, uh, let's be honest, uh, match up to the magnificence of the one here, but they are extremely friendly and very helpful people. And uh, the, the village of Boston Spa is, is very pleasant. It has some lovely pubs for lunch. So, you know. Oh, we um, do it again. Yeah. <laughs> you need another mission. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK, so um, we were talking, actually, we both agreed, my daughter and I, on Susan as our favourite character. She's got the smarts, hasn't mm. she? And she kind of gets it. And I love the fact that she just doesn't give a damn, does she? She's <laughs> just very out there and blunt with how she says things. Yeah. I did want one more little question. Mm. You've said how, and quite rightly, you can see them. Mm. Sure, being spot. <laughs> um, <laughs> What about the smells? Because you can al almost smell them, can't you? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I certainly noticed that reading the, um, the City Watch series. Um, this is a... I, I wanted to try and, and create the sense of those worlds as, as if they'd been directed by Ridley Scott. <laughs> you know? It's very gritty, it's granite. The smells, the, the, the oiliness, the sort of like, you know, the... The, the rancid cooking fat just wafting from the pub. Such things like that, the, the smell of it, absolutely, the, the musty, fusty from the drains mm. on those walked cobbles. Yes, absolutely. It's, that's, that really is something that does enter the theatre of the mind. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of authors will write about the, the creatures of the night making noises or the birds in the trees or whatever, and they completely forget that places smell. <laughs> <laughs> You know, unless they then sort of crowbar it in. Oh, the musty dungeon was this, that, the other. But yeah, but Terry, Terry created somehow three-dimensional scenarios that were more than just three-dimensional. It was sort of hyper-real. Yes, it, it, it combines in a unique way altogether. Mm. I notice a lot of people in this audience are choosing female characters as their favourites. There's hardly any in these stories. Isn't that... Surpri did that surprise you? I really noticed it because he's, his, as one of you said, his female characters are so compelling and so lovable and he writes them with such empathy and, and love. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it shocked me. Did it surprise you? Did you spot that? In a way, but I mean, Mother Christmas is a force to be reckoned with. Oh, she is, that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, in that story. She was not having any messing from her husband at all. <laughs> no, no, she's got it sorted. Yeah, yeah. And there's Mrs Cozy, isn't there, with the gnomes? Mrs Cozy with the gnomes. Mm -hmm. but I, I hadn't noticed that, but you're right, it's true. Mm. Yeah. I found it a surprise. He, uh, um, I think there's a guy over there who's been waiting for a while towards the far end of a row, 
And then let me choose um, the, the guy right behind him, and then I'll choose two next. I'll come over here next time. Hi, so my favorite character is Def, and because it's very reassuring at the end of your life, uh, he's written perhaps the, the most compassionate character to be there for you. Uh, you've mentioned a lot about how you see his journalism in his storytelling, but do you see much of his storytelling in his journalism when you were looking at his cub reporters sort of mundane reports? Did you see the bit of the sneaky storyteller kind of um, getting in there? I am, I'm going to slightly hedge my bets and say not really for a number of reasons. One was that we were finding the non fictional stuff for, for Colin. Um, and to be blunt, it wasn't that interesting. <laughs> because it was just a report of what happened when this football team played this football team. And the, the round thing went between the tall, upright things. <laughs> and people seemed to enjoy that. You know. uh, so we, 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 we skimmed the odd piece here and there. Mm. But I think he was so restricted in what he had to do for the assignment that the fictional things had to wait. Yeah, I mean, I think there was there were some flashes um, at some of the reviews, the theatre reviews mm. and so on, but he didn't have scope to do a great deal. Uh, he had to keep to the facts. And, uh, yeah. I, mean, I saw it, the, um, the piece that you had up there with Terry dressed as a wise man. Mm. Yeah. I just caught a glimpse of it when it was up there. That looked quite Terry-ish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, he was allowed to, uh, to, to do a few of those, and uh, Marcus as well on the midweek. Free press. Mm. He, he did some more adult pieces. Yeah, adult sounds wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not that sort of thing. <laughs> he, he did some bits about, you know, they are going to be bringing a new railway cutting through here, this, that, and the other, um, under the pseudonym of Marcus for the Bucks Free Press. Yeah, it was the midweek edition. Midweek yeah. edition of the Bucks yeah. Free Press. I do remember in Rob Wilkins' biography, he labels a lot of the anecdotes that Terry told him as TGTC for too good to check. Yeah. <laughs> so perhaps his storytelling made it into his <laughs> life, if not hopefully his journalism. Um, and the, there's a guy right at the back and then next time over here. Hi, yeah, my um, favourite characters are Sam Vimes and Moist von Litvig. Um, partly for Sam Vimes is because I'm called Sam and I, he was the first character I saw read. Um, my main sort of question is really, out of all the characters that he wrote, if we could get one more book, which character do you think deserved that one more book? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> 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 I, 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 if, if there was an official answer, if Terry was asked, I think he would probably say Moist von Lipwig, who is this wonderful character and gets two, two books. I mean, yes, he gets two entire books about him, but then that's it, we learn no more. And he had, he had a lot more ahead of him. But obviously I have to say death because <laughs> character. Got to keep him at the... Three. Ooh. You stand corrected. Yeah, yeah. I never said expert. I knew any of this stuff. People, <laughs> people just assume. I'd love to see how the witches coped with the more industrial revolution Ooh. side mm. of Angmore Pork and how they adapted and adopted that new way of working. Mm. Yeah, you could always have more witches. Yes. I tend mm, to agree. Yes. I also just quite like to have seen what, what Terry would have done next, I guess, mm. Whoever, whatever that would have been. I wonder if um, Sergeant Colon retires <laughs> and he steps away from um, you know the city watch and just has a quieter life for a short time but then a new destiny beckons <laughs> and he becomes a detective <laughs> <laughs> a little bit like Hetty Wainthrop <laughs> <laughs> sounds like you've thought about this before <laughs> There's such a sense of Dixon of Doc Green about him, I think. <laughs> Maybe he's on a, you know, a detective uh, series. I think we've got some fan fiction going on over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a hand right in the air, right at the back, so let's go there. And then the, there's um, <clears throat> two hands in front for the next and the next one. 
While we get a mic to them over there, sorry, I'm in the aisle. I just wanted to ask a question from online because we have people watching oh. around the world online and also in the UK. Um, so Abby asks, do you think that Terry would get a kick if he knew that his work was being discussed at the British Library? <laughs> or would he be sitting in the bar with a pint muttering load of bloody codswallop <laughs> if you ask me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yep. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty definitive, thank you. Um, yes. Hello. Oh dear. Um, Nanny Og is, is the character yes. because she mainly reminds me of my eccentric Welsh aunts. And <laughs> I, pref I like a character who writes the filthiest cookbook ever made. So <laughs> that's all good. Um, this question could go to John, but it could go to all five of you. Um, obviously, John, you associate certain characters with uh, people in mind when you voice them. And as someone who desperately wants to have your job at some point, um, do you also associate portions of Discworld with certain accents as well? Mm. Certain accents? Yes, I think so. I think in a practical sense, you want to distribute between a few uh, and have the contrasts there. Um, th there are some characters well, you know, maybe a, a London accent, a Cockney accent is quite a good one. You know, that's an accent for doing deals, doing business, you know, that kind of thing. You know, cut my own throat, that sort of thing. <laughs> you can just see them hustling. And, you know, there's others, you know, a Liverpool accent is quite good for, you know, when there's something to complain about. You know, <laughs> you know when there's a sense of, you know, this won't do, come on, fix it up. It's not much to ask, is it? I don't know, sometimes like with a, 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 a Glasgow accent, there's a sense of, um, I don't know, just a curiosity. And there's a musicality that sort of follows on quite nice. And it's sort of, it's not too far from Billy Conley, and I like that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Life's a waste of time, and time's a waste of life, so get wasted all the time, and you'll have the time of your life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you want to patchwork as much as you possibly can. Yeah. So accents do um, d do give uh, give that sense, yeah. I promised two more questions over here, and I've spotted the timers on this massive monitor in front of me. And I was hoping that after these two quick questions, we might just have time for John to read us one more story before bedtime. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a microphone's on its way. You asked me what was my favourite character. I think the librarian in oh, Unseen yeah. University. Oh. <laughs> and I think he deserved more, st more space. <laughs> uh, Honourable mention for Maledict and Granny Weatherwax for being very cool, but um, <laughs> my first Pratchett book was Thud, so Sam Vimes, just from like how much he cares. And how, like, who watches The Watchmen? I do, all the time. <laughs> um, I once went to a talk about uh, Pratchett's landscapes and like Discworld and like the kind of rich folkloric landscape um, that exists there. Um, but from what we've heard of these stories, it seems like maybe where it started was the people. And like maybe actually the, the world grew around the characters and, grew, and sort of became what they needed it to be. To, sort of explore the people more than the land? Does, does you think that's a sort of fair assessment? Of these particular stories, th these ones here? Yeah, it feels like like that was sort of the, the sort of trying to work, like working out what he wanted to talk about and what he wanted to write about was actually the core of that is the people rather than necessarily like a setting or like a world yeah, building. I think that, well, it, quite a lot of these are set in this in Black, Blackberry. Um, I feel like what he was doing with these stories was taking something and putting it on its head every time. So, so for example, the Scrooge story, it's Scrooge and you flip it over. Or there's, um, there's one that starts that um, you're listening to a seashell and, and it sort of takes that thing that we all did when we were kids and twists it around and gives it a whole other thing. So I think he just, these ones, I think he started with an idea and, and looked at it back to front and saw, saw what happened. That's my feeling. Mm. Yeah, I mean, people are really central to them all. Yeah. Speaking of Blackberry, 
John, do we have time for the great blackberry oh, I think pie? We do. I think we do. <laughs> I think we do. <coughs> uh, let me just line this one up. Ah, oh, there it is. There it is. Just to digress for a moment, you know, the foreword written by Neil Gaiman, of course, and I, I love that uh, story that uh, Neil described of um, the moment that, uh, that he and Terry first discussed good omens. And um, I, th I think the story went that Terry had received a synopsis and thought, now, this is, this is good, this is good. And he had a chat with Neil saying, you know, would you want, maybe you could sell me this or perhaps we could write it together. And uh, Neil's re reaction to that was to say, this is just as though uh, Michelangelo had uh, got in touch and said, you fancy doing a ceiling? <laughs> so, <laughs> I love that. Uh, I love that. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> this is the story of the great blackberry pie and the amazing events that happened in Gritcher on Christmas Day, 1850. You see, there lived in Blackberry a pleasant little town, really, a millionaire called Albert Wynne's partner. He was the mayor, and he had made his money selling rabbits to Australia. <laughs> he was small, round, and red-faced. One day in early December, he was strolling along the high street with his friend Blanket, the town clerk. You know, Blanket, he said, at this time of year, I can't help thinking about the poor people who won't have any Christmas dinner. Ah, said Blanket, who was thinking of something else entirely. <laughs> I reckon, said the mayor, we should do something. Take a note of this Blanket. I'll pay for oh, a hundred pies for the poor of Gritcher. Each pie to be a foot across. Pies at Christmas, just right. See to it. But Blanket wasn't paying attention. When he got back to his office, he told his assistant, who told a secretary and told Mr. William Plum, a noted baker, one pie, a hundred feet across, <laughs> said Plum. Are you sure? But, well, a hundred feet across, Mr. Plum thought about it. A smile crept across his face. This was his big moment. Next day, he was very busy. He rounded up all the bakers and butchers in Blackberry and told them of his plan. It'll be a magnificent pie, he cried. A king of pies, the biggest pie there has ever been. A pie so delicious. A small man in a high black hat with a thick cigar in his mouth strolled up. You don't want cooks, he said. You want an engineer for a pie that size. <laughs> My name's Isambard Brunel. <laughs> and since I'm not building any ships or railways at present, I think I'll turn my attention to the really hard problem of building a 100-foot pie. <laughs> and he did. He cleared a big area on the outskirts of the town and set a thousand men to work to build the biggest oven in the world. Brunel lit another cigar. Where, he said, are we going to get a 100-foot pie dish? <laughs> It'd have to be the size of a gasometer. He looked towards Blackberry Gasworks and grinned. <laughs> A moment later, 50 men headed in that direction with a large saw. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, hundreds of carts were coming up the hill, laden with supplies. 500 tons of flour, said Mr. Plum, ticking them off on a long list. Three tons of salt, two tons of pepper, 200 of onions, and one bay leaf. <laughs> The gasometer was manhandled into place, upside down, and 200 pastry, cook, pastry cooks started to lay the foundations of the pie. Then more carts came from butchers for miles around with beef, mutton, chicken, goose, lamb, bacon, and dripping. They shoveled the lot in, and their great lid was lowered into place. Then Brunel lit the oven 
with the end of his cigar. <laughs> Amazing, said Plum the baker, running up to the hastily constructed pie office. I have a telegram here that says the Queen is coming. Everyone stood to attention, and Mr. Brunel at once started to work on designs for a 50-foot 50 50 royal pie slicer. <laughs> By now, the pie was a big attraction. While it stood steaming on its great oven, small boys roasted chestnuts in the fire. A fair had grown up around it. Sightseers were taken on tours round the warm crust <laughs> for half a crown a time while the Blackberry Volunteer Silvery Band played a selection of waltzes. Mr. Plum went to bed on Christmas Eve and dreamed of the fame that would be his when Queen Victoria cut the pie. But he woke up, sweating. Good heavens, he said, struggling into his trousers. The egg cup! We forgot about the egg cup! Down Blackberry High Street ran Plum the baker, his trousers and bare feet just as the sun was rising. The great bulk of the giant pie loomed over the town. Plum started to bang desperately on the pie office door, and it was opened by Brunel in his nightshirt. What's the matter? <laughs> we forgot about the egg cup, panted Plum. What's so important about an egg cup, said Brunel, rubbing his eyes and staring up at the pie. A dull rumble was coming from it. You've got to put an egg cup in the pie to let the air out when it's cooking. If you don't, it explodes. Gracious. <laughs> By now, the sun was up and people were flocking towards the pie ground. Brunel thought about the damage a monster pie could do and shuddered. He rushed to the oven and listened. There was certainly something going on inside the thick crust. Stand back. Stand back, he cried. I think it's gonna rumble, 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 bang. Red hot pastry scythed through haystacks 10 miles away. Molten gravy shot up like a water spout. A lump of beef and onions took the top of the town hall. <laughs> Peas whizzed about like bullets. The great top crust with no egg cup in it was never seen again. <laughs> and in Shropshire, there was a short, sharp shower of suet. <laughs> With cries of joy, the people of Blackberry grabbed knives and forks and set to, and the town was silent, except for the sound of chewing. Fifty miles away, Queen Victoria watched a large, crust-like object sail over Windsor <laughs> and said, I don't find that at all amusing. <laughs> Another time, said Brunel on the church steeple to Plum who was hanging from the weathercock, <laughs> just as some seasonal snow started to fall. I'll stick to railways. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> Thank you, John and Alison, Pat and Jan. That has been such fun talking to you tonight. I'm sorry we've gone over time. That's my fault. We could have gone on all night. Um, Terry was often asked for some reason, what would you like at your memorial? And he often said, I'd like to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not fair that he's not here with us to answer questions and to do the voices, but we are so grateful to all of you for joining us to celebrate these new old stories that have been published in a book for the first time together. Thank you all very much.